audience, welcome. Really excited that you could join us uh, for today's webinar, Elevating Presales to Really Own That Product Experience. Um, my name is Rachel Tillman. I'll be serving as your host today. So I'm normally based in Austin, Texas. I'm also a manager uh, for presales at Braze. And I've been involved with the Presales Collective for almost two years now doing both these webinars and in-person events. So if you're ever in Austin, let me know. We would love to have you join. Uh, and we're going to get kicked off here today with a poll. So I uh, would love you guys to fill out which option best describes your role. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and get some, some answers here while we're teeing up today's panel. Awesome. Cool. Just take a minute. Good. Looks like we have a fair fair mix of uh, leaders and ICs here today. Um, I'll give people just one more minute to answer this poll. Cool. Okay. So um, I don't know. Let's see. Can I share the results? Um, we have a, a, a fair number of people that are both interested in pre-sales. Um, in joining us as well as some of us that are actually in the industry, which I think is really great for today's topic because today's topic, we're really talking about elevating pre-sales as part of owning that product experience. And we're really passionate about this topic because we all know the world of B2B buying has changed. Um, buyer's decision-making journey is really influenced on how the product works, how it adds value to their position, how it scales, uh, what its security is, and ultimately how that product is going to solve problems. And so the role of pre-sales has become really pivotal to success uh, in this, and we can really make or break a deal because of how we present and experience that product. So Today's topic is really, uh, I would, I'm going to hear from our panelists today about every step of the buying process and how pre-sales is that link between the buyer and the product. So before they even start engaging with our process, they typically want to see our product. We're seeing demos a lot earlier. And um, whether that's good or bad, or there's ways to control that, I'm really excited to get our panelists' thoughts on this today. So, and, and I think it's also important to notice we have a few leaders on the call. We're going to have a Q&A portion, but would love for you guys to be thinking about, is your pre-sales department considered a demo department or are you thriving and growing and really being that connection between pre-sales and product? Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm excited to uh, talk a little bit about our goal for today. And um, these are our panelists. They'll introduce themselves shortly. And this is our agenda. So I'm going to give a quick welcome. Um, we will go through and, and we have some really good Q&A prepared with our panelists today. And then the last maybe 15, 20 minutes, I'm actually going to turn it over to you guys uh, if there's any Q&A from the audience. And then we will wrap up. Uh, and I also want to start by saying thank you to all of you guys who are here today for making Presales Collective possible. Um, you're really going to get the most out of pre-sales if you are involved, uh, whether that's in your local communities, uh, hosting an event, or choosing to get involved, or if you're just attending uh, webinars like this one, or um, there's also professional development opportunities for all ends of the spectrum. So whether you're interested in pre-sales or your career pre-sales person, we look forward to having you as part of our community. Um, so to get the most out of today's session, please feel free to ask questions. We do have a relatively small group today, so I'm hoping the chat will be pretty active and we can make this really engaging. Uh, I know our panelists have a lot to share there. It was really fun preparing with them. Uh, we all feel very passionately about this topic, but we also want you to be involved. So raise your hand, ask a question, um, and, and feel free to let us know if we have any questions. Shauna from Presales Collective will be monitoring the chat, helping us out with some of that too. So um, without further ado, would love to uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. If you guys can just say hello, what's your current role, where you're based, and how long have you been in presales? And uh, let's see, we'll start with Leah. 
Hi, great. Thanks, Rachel. So hi, everyone. I'm Leah McTiernan, GVP of Presale Solution and Strategy at DocuSign, based in Philadelphia. Um, my purview started as just solution engineering, but over the eight years I've been here, my remit has expanded to include proposal management, solution architects, value engineering, and most recently, an industry go-to-market team. Um, I started my pre-sales career at IBM over 17 years ago, and I can't let an intro pass for anyone that knows me without mentioning. Um, I'm super proud of the fact that I co-founded the DocuSignWise ERG with Kelly Podersky, and I'm the executive sponsor of the pre-sales collective um, WISE program. Awesome. Thanks, Leah. Yeah. Uh, let's pass it on over to Tanya. I have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How Tanya. do I follow that introduction? <laughs> Please, come on. <laughs> um, nice to meet everyone. Tanya Fadul. I'm the VP of Product Management and Engineering at DocuSign for a very special um, group called Incubations. Many of you might be familiar with uh, groups like ours um, in several companies were called labs or accelerators. Uh, so we work on kind of cutting edge innovation. Um, we co-develop with really high value customers and members of the field. So we work really closely with pre-sales specifically to help grow, expand accounts, derive demand, um, and enter into new spaces and delight customers at the end of the day. So I look forward to talking a little bit about that partnership um, here today. Awesome. And Greg, round us out. Well, so as you can tell, the reason they invited me is because they wanted a gray-haired old guy in the room so we could have some <laughs> conversation about that. So Greg Dickinson, I founded Omadim. I've been in the pre-sales industry since about 1991, so quite a while. Um, first and foremost, I think it's the most important job of B2B sales. Always, once a pre-sales engineer, always a pre-sales engineer. But I think as I went through my career, I always thirsted for tools and technology that could augment our job, right? And make it easier for us to do what we do because we do, what we do is very important to the, to the selling process. So founded Omadim to kind of help um, and, uh, you know, thankful for Pre-Sales Collective for creating such a strong community of, of other pre-sales engineers that can get together and learn from each other because frankly, I think Lee will say the same thing. This wasn't here 17 or 20 years ago, right? It was just, you went out and did your thing and you hope you did a good job and you just, you know, learn from, from others. So thanks everyone for joining today. It was awesome. like the best and job no one ever heard of, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Unless you I messed know. up. <laughs> right, that's true. And and we do want to thank Omadan and Greg for uh, sponsoring this conversation today. We'll get to that a little bit more, but appreciate you being here, Greg. Um, and I also want to make a quick call out before I start asking questions. The chat has been fixed, so evidently there are some some a few uh, technical issues with the chat. But feel free, it looks like it's all up and running again. So keep those Q&As coming to the chat as we talk today. Um, so Greg, I wanna hop back to something you just said. Uh, that is a long time to be in pre-sales. We would love to know, uh, to kind of kick us off today a little bit, how is the buyer experiencing changing? Yeah, so I think, you know, in one word, dramatically, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, if you, if you, look at the, the, the old way kind of, of, of selling from 10, 15 years ago, right? The demo was held hostage. It was at the end of the cycle. And, you know, when the salesperson got everything that they wanted, they would then release the demo. And, you know, we went through that process. But today, for many reasons, convenience, there's much more buyers in the buying process. There is perhaps companies have much more velocity they need to do, and they can't have those elongated sales cycles. And, so I think Tanya will talk about the products have become a little bit more friendly, right? And so people can, you know, can utilize that. So we find that the buying experience now, right, is fundamentally, I think the solution engineer is engaged early because before a customer will evaluate, before they'll engage, before they'll buy, before they'll upgrade, before they'll renew, they need to really be comfortable with that product and they need to understand the breadth and depth. And I think the biggest use case I always use is think of a word processor for me. I, I open it, I type, I spell check, and I print. That's really not sticky, right? I can go to any word process. So how do you expose those buyers to your product and the value and the use cases across that? And I think that, that as Leo will talk about in just one second, is that, yeah. that, that motions change. But I think first also need to remember that 
buyers today don't want to do 100% on their own. They still want that guided approach, right? They still want that pre-sales engineer, that thought leadership or that salesperson to kind of help them along that journey. It's never, you know, maybe not never is the wrong word, but it's never 100%. So Leah, what is your experience right at DocuSign, you know, kind of a different motion? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you overall. I think the shift it slowly started years ago, but it's just dramatically accelerated post COVID. And I think, you know, it's an on demand world and a modern buyer wants access to content and a consumable format so they can do their own research as much as possible, especially upfront. So, I mean, my view is for companies selling something like this is a great thing because you know, to your point, Greg, like when a buyer is finally ready to engage with sales, it's much more likely to be a better engagement because you now have an educated buyer that's knowledgeable. And sometimes that knowledge was those like overview demos that you'd have to do in the beginning. And they're like, eh, am I sure? Like, do I, and you're trying to understand if it's qualified or not, right? Like that part is happening now. Um, so then when the account team and the customer is really ready to engage, it's more meaningful. It's more meaningful discovery, solution designing, and you can really lean in on, you know, the demos and the process tailored to their business and their industry. And honestly, it makes for a higher quality engagement for all parties on both sides that, you know, ideally is going to lead to better outcomes as well. Agree more. Yeah. yeah. And and Leah, one thing I, I love what you just said about the buyer experience. How are you guys optimizing for this uh, DocuSign? Like, yeah. You know, what are you looking for? I mean, I think it's a journey for us for sure. And like all, you know, all of us here, like being in and around pre sales role for many years now, I mean, you grow to understand like every customer. And that's part of the great part about this role. Like every day you're solving different challenges for different customers, and every buyer is different and you need to meet the buyer where they are in their journey. And so, as we were just talking about, it's been a massive shift that we're seeing from self-service digital first, top of funnel. And I think as Greg said, the more exploring a buyer can do to learn about your products without a sales team involved, the better because there's just an efficiency and a value to be gained on both sides there. So specifically <laughs> at DocuSign, we're seeing this play out several ways. And I mean, also keep in mind, like our sales motions are vast because everyone in the world is a customer. So we need to support consumer through small, medium business, mid-sized business up through majors and enterprise level companies. So we have a lot of data and analytics that help us identify a high velocity sales motion where really a account executive should own the end to end because the value of the deal or the cost of sale, right? Doesn't even warrant bringing a pre-sales resource um, to the table. Yeah. Yeah. So if the AE can use digital assets, videos, click through demos to effectively close those deals without pre-sales, like we view that as a really good thing because that lets us focus on the more dynamic consultative strategic engagements and you know pre-sales like we want to be challenged we want to be solving these you know complex problems that you know to help our customers deliver the outcomes that they're looking for their business and, and also their customers and so I think most pre-sales people definitely don't want to be you know doing that same you know tactical in a box demo and talk track every day so that that's one area um, I think if you know we look at our more strategic um, opportunities where pre-sales is attached, there's still an important role um, that you know we see for I'll just say like digital assets and that upfront education as we were discussing, um, because we don't want to lead with product or or demo. We want to lead with conversation and we want to lead with discovery, and and until a buyer you know, and, you know, buyers don't always want <laughs> to leave with discovery. So it's a good gate, right? It's a qualifier to, for us to say, great, like, here's all these assets and content you can explore on your own. But when you're ready um, to bring this, the key stakeholders to the table 
for that conversation, for that discovery, um, you can continue, you know, once they're ready, like that's, that's the sign for us, right? And so we'll, we're really trying to use, you know, here's the self-service until you're ready to kind of have that conversation. And then we know, okay, like we've, we've got likely a much more qualified deal. Um, and that's when the sales team can engage and, you know, just jump into understanding the business and customize and tailoring, um, you know, how we're going to run that sales cycle. And even better if there's platforms or ways, like as you're building these, you know, more tailored assets now for this customer, um, that you can put it into portals or provide it back to them because then they can begin to sell internally on our behalf as well. So we're, we're kind of seeing it in those, you know, a couple different ways. And then, you know, the big benefit is if you can provide these assets where there's, um, you know, actual usage, tele telemetry, statistics on, you know, hey, is the customer actually like opening and like viewing this? Are they sharing it with others um, and understanding, you know, you know, where uh, the assets that you're building that are resonating the most with the customer, then you, you could start to profile and pattern from that as well. Um, and you can also gauge how interested the buyer might be in actually buying. So um, those are yeah. just a few areas, yeah. I think that just a couple of reactions to what you said, Leah, I think like yeah. data is power, right? So yeah. having those digital assets or videos or whatever it might be that actually can feed you and make your teams more successful and how they tailor their approach to any given sales cycle, whether that's top of funnel, mid funnel. I mean, this could happen at any stage in the journey, really. I think that's, Absolutely. that's power, right? And I think a company really needs to help feed the pre-sales organization with that type of data. So that's a, that's a really interesting thing. The other is, um, I think you said like meet, um, meet buyers where they are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that we're all given a wealth of data at this point, just as consumers, like put pre-sales aside, put, you know, DocuSign aside, whatever that might be. As buyers, information is all around us and we want it to be accessible. Um, and we certainly want, um, as adults, we want bite-sized pieces of information in order to lead us toward some sort of decision or outcome. And that outcome might be an engagement with pre-sales at a company of choice. And I think in this interesting time, especially post-COVID, that's not only happening from nine to five. It's right. happening at night. It's happening on weekends. It's happening globally with people who are remote and located everywhere. And it's happening collaboratively with people that kind of um, have a community-based approach to how they buy. So maybe they're sharing it with friends or sharing it with colleagues or sharing it with team members. So those are also kind of added um, complexity as to how the experience I think is changing and why data is honestly now more important than ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, you think about the data and that, you know, and our experience for our customers, almost 50% of the digital engagement is done before 9 a.m. after six or on weekends. And it's amazing that our customers come back and say, gee, you know, so-and-so was in the portal taking a demo. We didn't even know they were interested in X and Y. And so to Leah's point of that, that digital, you know, in our world, it's they search, they ask questions and you get answers. And what we found is pretty interesting, right? Is, and, and this is a little bit of slight on sales people. When I was a demo person and, and pre-sales, the salesperson was never taking my notes for me of what questions were asked. They were always on the end of their chair, hoping they could get an answer, you know, talk as soon as I finished, right? They, they wanted to jump into the conversation. Well, now when that, that buyer is able to on their own, not intimidated by their boss, they can ask whatever questions they want. We get all that back as solution engineers to formulate, to your point, Leah, that when we do, when they do engage, they're smarter, but so are we, right? We really understand that digital footprint and that buyer intent. So I think it goes, it's a win-win, right? It's not a sacrifice, it's a win-win. Um, and, and, you know, Tanya, your point of data is everywhere, let's use it, right, to our advantage and then help shorten that sales cycle and shorten that buying experience. They don't want to, you know, start over. I love the data. The data is power, right? Like that is really well said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a great kind of segue into data giving us this power and understanding of the growing needs of our buyers. So Tanya, I'd love to ask you as the leader of an incubation and innovation team, you work with both product and pre-sales to kind of meet these growing needs. How do you manage that process today? 
Yeah, I think just kind of on the point of data and being able, data is as good as what you do with it, right? So, I mean, I think it's really important to, data can be power, it can also be an Achilles heel. So um, I'm a firm believer in a programmatic approach. So I believe if you build a transparent framework, it allows us to kind of accelerate development, a roadmap, co-develop or innovate with customers and really use the data to catalyze results, what we do next. Um, it can give us a sense of um, what might be coming up from a demand perspective. It could be um, areas of friction. It could be um, a, an ability for us to actually quantify revenue generated results. There are so many different things that we could um, derive from insights, but that's why you need something that's programmatic so that it's not willy nilly or it's not at different phases. It's actually, um, we're, we're able to um, gather those metrics and then derive of those insights collectively and in, in real time. I, I kind of, when Leah and I work together to build what, what I'll tell you a little bit about, but the program that we work on together, one of the things that I thought about was kind of like, you know, it's like Navy SEALs, even though it might seem like we're slowing down um, with a programmatic approach, um, the Navy SEALs motto is slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So it's doing it, it's kind of like a slow down to speed up methodology. So I partnered with Leah um, and the SE organization as an example to build a program called CODE. Um, CODE kind of starts with the customer need, um, so it stands for customer need, opportunity analysis, demand, um, and execution. So all parties are kind of involved in the demand generation and execution. And the code program is really about better serving our customers. And the objective is how we can challenge ourselves to innovate faster on their behalf. So, you know, within pre-sales, we're interacting with customers all day long. And, you know, product doesn't necessarily get that benefit. We interact with customers surely. But in so many cases, we're having to work with internal stakeholders, we're doing research, we're working with engineering, whatever else that might be. And so the code pro program provides a construct for pre-sales to interface with product and bring, bring direct visibility to our um, customers' needs that we hear about in the field. And then we accelerate how we, how we solve for them in a collaborative way. So it's all about kind of being agile and then having everyone participate in where we go next. So what actually is... Um, amazing is having all of these folks sit in a room and every six weeks talk about what a solution could be to a very, you know, common set of problems or a really unique problem that we might want to explore. It's when you get a bunch of people who are interested in what the customer problems are and how to solve for them, um, you really do start to see this incredible cultivation of creativity. It's a, it's a really wonderful thing. So the approach that we use to deploy the program has been of course, define, a, define kind of the code program itself, identify a SME team, so some subject matter experts that had been nominated that um, uh, would be participants in um, input and making sure that we had a really common and programmatic uh, input strategy. And then um, we created a framework to collect our customer needs and assess priority. So these are also people who aren't, um, afraid to say, nope, these three things are not a priority, like these absolutely are, and here's why. So, um, and that's that's rare, right? A lot of people might say everything is a priority and then therefore nothing is a priority from a product perspective. So it's really great that um, we have folks like that. And then I think most importantly, again, we have measurable success criteria in place so that we can align the revenue to churn prevention, customer satisfaction, and so on. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the code program later, but that's really how I try to kind of manage the process and make it beneficial to all parties, um, especially ultimately our customers. So I don't know, Leah, if you have anything else to add. Yeah. I mean, well, one, it's just been a fantastic collaboration <laughs> to do it with you, but I mean, I feel like I've been at DocuSign almost, well, eight years. I know you've been at DocuSign eight years and mm -hmm. I feel like until code, um, we didn't really have a programmatic approach for how to evaluate, prioritize, and like you said, ultimately accelerate development to meet our customer needs. And the code program now provides a, 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 a new construct for us to do that. And it's helping us meet the growing needs of buyers faster. 
But I think, um, you know, especially for this audience as well, it's really expanding the role of traditional pre-sales work. So code is a huge motivator for our teams um, to do that meaningful, challenging, interesting work, and it's providing stretch opportunities. Um, many times that might have executive visibility, um, and there's, you know, it's just been I think really well received on on both sides, um, from like a prod dev and a and a pre sales perspective, and you know, I like the north star, especially in our world on the pre sales side, is like, you know, I actually really get to have this level of input into product management and engineering and designing our roadmap, you know, North Star, like way out there is maybe I'd get my name on a patent, but just the whole thing, it's a huge motivator um, for our team. So it's just a win-win like all around. Just, I completely yeah, agree. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, speaking of, you know, this in product communication or product led growth really becoming more of this focus, uh, especially with things like code that you guys have developed. Tanya, can you share your point of view on really the opportunity here? Like, ultimately, why is that product experience important? Yeah. I mean, again, I think you've heard us say some of those reasons where people are everywhere and they're not working in a box anymore. Um, we have to realize that the boundaries are um, very fuzzy at this point. So intuitive product experiences are more important now than ever. I mean, again, as consumers, like if we put ourselves in the shoes of any of our consumers, we know that a lousy product experience is going to totally chase us away. Like we're not going to use a product that certainly isn't easy um, or that provides more time or more friction in my day. <laughs> it's just like, the, the way that we operate now. And the last thing we want is, you know, experience like if you think about, I don't know, calling a phone tree as an example, press one, press two, press three to get to wherever. How many times have you just like hung up the phone? Too much, can't do it versus an experience that's on demand or what I like to use the word um, assisted quite a bit, but like an assisted experience like Alexa where it anticipates your needs. Um, Alexa's our best friend, right? And, you know, same with Einstein or Watson, like brilliant marketing ideas have come from in product related assisted experiences. So good products, product experiences typically increase usage, they build loyalty, they improve net promoter scores. Um, and I think with more and more people, I think maybe it was um, Leah who said this, but, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to interact with other humans until we've got gathered enough information, right? And so um, you're seeing that you know some products or companies really lack kind of a formal training or onboarding as a part of their sales or adoption cycle. So users are kind of expected to dive in, figure it out, and then contact or be proactively contacted um, at some stage in their journey. So. If that's really the case, and we're seeing like data is proving that that's the case, then the product must be clear, discoverable, well labeled, and in app support should be available from when, within the product. Everything should be embedded. So, you know, if we think about again, kind of summarizing what like the customer product experience should be, it should guide, it should educate, it should nudge users along the appropriate points. So, again, like I want something to anticipate my needs. Um, and I might not know I want that, but as I'm kind of searching for something or going into something, if a bot or again, like an assistant was to tell me, hey, like based on these set of behaviors, you might actually want to consider X, Y, or Z, then um, it's great because there's enough context without distracting me from the task at hand. Yep. And, you know, you're seeing some of these trends continuing to take shape. So AI chatbots, like I mentioned, predictive analytics, video marketing, personalized communication that's throughout your experience. And, you know, it's great because businesses can actually use some of these trends to better engage with their customers along the life cycle. So you're not just looking at kind of a single point of sale life cycle as well. So the future is really around business and customer value, which allows you to be more global. It allows you to be more community driven, which again is where kind of buyers are going. 
And I think that's super aligned with pre-sales mission. Like if you really think about what can feed, and I firmly believe this, this is why I've partnered so closely with Leah and the pre-sales team is that, um, you know, who, who can be better than sharing those frontline trends than the folks that are working with our customers every single day and asking not just about them, but about their customers, which is ultimately what we're doing here. We're helping to facilitate, most companies are helping to facilitate a customer's customer experience. So yeah, I mean, I think a customer value driven approach is really what it all kind of comes down to. Yeah, I mean, from my personal experience, that customer value piece is centered to what we do at pre for any pre-sales role um, yeah. and really making sure that we're delivering values, not just for our customers, but our customers' customers. Yeah, Greg, I would love your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, well said, right? So not a lot I can add on to that, but I think that if you think of the pre-sales role and the product experience and you move it up a little bit before they become a customer, Right. I think a lot of companies say, oh, product led growth, we'll just go for it. And I think people need to stop and think that product led growth is two things. Is the product 100 percent usable by the user without any kind of you know, help? And number two, the organization, right? The organization, if you look at the best DocuSign is one of them, right? How they're organized and how they go to market is is fundamentally different. So I think the what we see our customers using our technology for is to be able to augment that experience. I and mean, you can't just turn over the keys. Right. You just don't want to do that. That, 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 you know, one demo, how do you help that buyer that, by the way, if there's eight or nine of them have a different perspective and to your point, Tanya, their, you know, their Alexa experience is going to be different than somebody else's because what they're looking for in the product is different, right? The compliance buyer versus a technical buyer versus that business buyer, right? How do you augment that at number one? Number two, think about the fact that all buyers don't learn at the same pace. I might get into a software tool and learn it day one, or it may take me 20 quote unquote demos to Leah's earlier experience of how does that person learn on their own? And it's not a linear, we think the sales cycle is linear. You will do these eight steps and they'll buy, a buyer may repeat, it may be an iterative process. They wanna come back to that portal, they wanna revisit something, they visited something and now they wanna dig a little deeper, right? And you've allowed them to do that with a good product experience. And I think the last key is that people get confused with product experience and demo. I think they're different. When someone's buying from DocuSign, I'll say this is it's not about just the product features. It's also about the whole product security. What about scalability? What about adoption? All those things are what pre-sales engineers own in that experience, because I'm not going to buy until I'm sure DocuSign went through a whole time where that people are worried about security. Oh my gosh, I'm going to sign digitally. And then that's going to be legal. Well, that's a conversation. That's a product experience you have to Absolutely. convey to that buyer well beyond, hey, let me show you how I can add a follower to my document, right? Or, you know, how can I add a co-signer? That's kind of a function. That's not the whole product. So I think when you think of product experience, if I'm a pre-sales engineer today, think about everything that implementation is important to them, right? Adoption is important to them, security, scalability, ease of use, right? All those different things are the product experience. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's such a, cre a critical, I was going to say really important reason, but critical reason uh, why this is also something leadership needs to be oriented towards. So I think this question is really for all three of you. How can we in pre-sales leadership really uh, come about that pre-sales is focused on just the demo portion of the job rather than the full holistic buyer experience and everything that that encompasses? So basically, like, how do we deepen the use of pre-sales just beyond being there for the demo? I can jump in, Rachel, and kind of start. Um, so, I mean, obviously, right, you know, bias panel here, but <laughs> I think there's like such an important role for pre-sales to play in this like ongoing buyer experience from, you know, pre-sale to adoption to expansion. And, you know, we're really working hard right now. Um, and, and I think our mindset, especially given this like macro world we're living in and is we wanna broaden um, the role of pre-sales, right? And, and what pre-sales can provide for our customers. So we just talked about like one, you know, the code program and working side by side to really, really drive roadmap based on customer needs. It's a huge focus for us. Um, I think, 
you know, relationships and building like, again, pre-sales, not just looking at, okay, the account exec is going to own the relationship. I'm going to let them, that's their lane. They play there. It's, you know, it's huge for pre-sales who arguably will have more credibility to start to build their own relationships. And I think, you know, our mindset is like when you can work with customers to understand their needs better than anyone else, like that puts you in a really good position to really start to become more of that partner, right? That partner uh, relationship. So it is much, it's just, it is much more than a demo. Like it, it pre-sales, you know, can lean in on, you know, not just the relationship, but, you know, making sure they're putting the work in because it's work, right? You have to understand and know the customer, know the space, understand their business needs, the challenges, the outcomes. And like, like we've been saying, right, that they not, that they want to drive ultimately for their customers. And when you can help sales with the white spacing, the strategic account planning, um, again, rolling up your sleeves to help do the research sometimes with value, if you're looking at ROI and points of view and outcomes to design the solutions and strategies that's gonna you know, ultimately help the customers. Um, it's a consultative mindset, right? I think that's also like a big shift that we're seeing pre-sales is consulting and it's it's advising on strategic decisions um, and, 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 and roadmap um, for the customer as well as the company. Sorry, my phone keeps going off, but it's back to what I was talking about in the beginning too, I think in, in the sense of, you know, we don't want to be working on those more transactional high velocity motions. Um, we want to be pushing up and to the right to be building and, and working with our customers, you know, as a true partner. Um, so that's where, you know, it, it just gets so much bigger than, than just doing that demo um, from my perspective. I think that the, um, just to kind of anchor on the couple words you yeah. use around consulting and advising. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's the way that um, I value the relationship and the partnership most with, yeah. from a product and pre-sale perspective. I think it's critical to influence the roadmap in the right way. If we can mm -hmm. think something that makes sense, we'll hear it <laughs> from one customer. But in order to deliver the most value for our customers and to our customers, we need to leverage things like the code program as an example to help identify patterns at scale so that if one customer is dealing with one challenge or one problem, and maybe we solve for that thing, um, that no other customer has to deal with that thing again. So there's a huge opportunity there. It's, an, it's a motivator for your teams, Leah, to do kind of meaningful and interesting work because they'll help advise yeah. and consult, um, if you will, on what the actual outcome does look like, what the solution looks like, and they act as the voice of the customer. So they'll anticipate the needs of the customer to help us kind of decipher, like, this is nice to have versus need to have, or bridge the gaps on um, maybe solutions that do exist. So help us kind of, I, I call it like um, that middle, like we have that, sometimes that gap in the middle that they help us really um, massage. And then, you know, I think the other piece is they help us incubate new concepts or early POCs with customers to derive a business case. So if you weren't consulting or advising or just seen as demoers, as an example, like, or, or a demo arm, then you wouldn't be necessarily folks that are helping us to build solutions. Like we're not building products with um, these members of code, we're building customer customer focused innovation. And that's a that's a fundamental difference in the way that we think about things. So again, if we build for one customer to help one customer, we miss a really big opportunity. So we look at ourselves as kind of a collective, like ask ourselves the question, does it scale? And let's look to make the answer yes, as often as possible. So I think that's kind of the, um, the crux of it is the advisement um, and consulting acts as a voice of the customer as we influence the road not moving forward. Can't agree more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there, um, like, as we kind of talk about this, more thought leadership and, and kind of bringing in some of this consultative approach, 
Um, do you guys see this as elevating the existing pre-sales teams to take that more into enroll? Or do you think it's creating kind of a merged organization of what traditionally was customer success in pre-sales? Yeah, I'm going to leave organization off for a second because that could be a three-hour conversation, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and Leah knows that better than I do. But, I, but think about, right, we're in a SaaS world. People buy, and majority of the time, the majority of the people that buy are not the ones that kind of implement and start using the product and right users across the enterprise where it used to be you, you sold a product and it was used only by accounts payable. Heck, look at DocuSign used by the whole company. Look at like a CRM used by the whole company. So I think that pre-sales needs to own that experience and help right with getting those those early customers that customer success owns up to speed but at the same time resource constraints right i'm sure leah can talk about the fact that if you deployed half of your resources to go do that now what because you own a number somewhere that someone has to be responsible for so i think what we've what we've seen is that companies can augment their best top talent in a in a digital asset world or a video world to be able to help that buyer on their own when it's convenient for them to be able to experience those things they want to and it augments a pre-sales but it also augments customer success. Because I don't mean to be slighting, but you hire a customer success person not to be a, a, someone that understands the product deeply and can give demos. You hire them for other skills that are necessary to make sure the customer is successful, to make sure the customer renews, to make sure the customer is driving value. It's kind of like the old acronym of, I don't like when SDRs give demos, because that's not what you hired them for. You hired them to do you know, prospecting. So I think we need to respect that, but I think how do you help that organization augment augmented that organization through pre-sales with, with, some, with some technology would, would, is what I see to be a strong win. And then you can also get some metrics out of that as well. We, I mean, Leah, from an organization perspective, you're probably seeing this, right? Because that's a big pain point I hear all the time from people in your chair saying, gosh, the turnover is hard, it's difficult, and it's resource intensive. What, what are you seeing? What's your yeah. thought? Yeah, yeah. Well, one, I mean, I'll reinforce this because I think sometimes this is looked at as like, that it, like this is a bad thing, but I think it's a, a very good thing. The more business we can have account executives take down on their own, the better, right? Just the scale and efficiency you drive there is, is huge. And so to kind of, because it's again, it's it's giving us as you know true pre-sales professional the opportunity to do that next level um, work. So to kind of take the organization side of this one, though, I mean, I think it's it's a like it's a I would put it in the hot topic category um, <laughs> in the industry right now. Um, I mean, you know, we have a pre-sales organization, we have a CSM organization at DocuSign. I mean, I know just from kind of my network and talking to, to peers, um, we have seen the evolution in in some cases of pre-sales and customer success roles merging into one. Um, I think there's so many factors that that go into that kind of decision from the industries and segments you serve to, you know, the solutions that you're building and, and actually selling. I mean, I can, you know, say I actually know two companies um, where they they combine, they said, yeah, we're, we're going to combine the SE and the, the CSM role. Um, and I think in one case, um, you know, they one company's seen great success there, right? Um, and I think on the on the flip side, on another side, um, it, it really it it probably wasn't a success. It, it's not working out. So I think you know, again, many factors to evaluate at DocuSign. And I think to your point, we really view these as like there's distinct um, objectives or roles or lanes that these two like um, positions play. And we're focused on having the best partnership we possibly can with our CSMs. Um, and it's a stronger together mentality, um, putting the customer first. I mean, I think there's obviously there's, you know, we have, you know, Tanya and code and, and wanting to accelerate and drive innovation on one side. And also, you know, wanting to make sure our customers are, are getting value out of the investment that they put into the solution and truly using that and feeling, you know, as passionate as we do um, about, about that. And so there is, you know, especially in larger um, enterprise accounts, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, and I would say right now, like there's plenty of work to do on the pre-sale <laughs> side. So, um, but it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting topic to keep an eye on. And I'm sure we'll probably continue to see some organizations 
may evaluate bringing that role together and, and others, you know, kind of having the more distinct motions moving forward. Yeah, so as we keep an eye on the future, I have one more question and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, so, and maybe Greg, you can take this with, with some of your experience, but where do you see the buyer experience growing in the next year? Are there any trends that you're noticing in the industry as you guys help with demos kind of across the gamut? Yeah, and I think I think so. The context for that, right? And, and just you know, take a second to say that they've been doing this for a little bit, right? They've been doing this for a while. And I think if you think back to you know the '90s, early 2000s, right? The pre-sales engineer. I mean, my job was make sure the projector was had a, a light bulb that worked. I, I carried the projector. The demo was on the laptop. I had to be fully configured, fully ready to go. I got in, I got set up, and then my of course my salesperson would say, "Listen, just let me give two minute introduction." And then you can start the demo. Well, 30 minutes later, right? It was my turn to go, right? <laughs> and, and that was the process. Well, as we did this rehearsal, I think it was Sean that said, Greg, we don't even use projectors anymore, right? So, so thing that that role of where he's talked earlier about where it sat, right, is changed. And I think fundamentally also because you know, perpetual license pre-sales engineer versus SaaS, as mm -hmm. I said earlier, that the idea that pre-sales engineer is engaged with the engagement, evaluation, buy, upgrade, renewal, right? That that all that revenue, I, if I'm really boastful, I would say the reason we had this webinar is you need to elevate the role of pre-sales because they're responsible for more revenue than ever before, right? It's not just the demo than a heavily two or three hour scripted demo where everyone was in the conference room and you did it one time and everyone was there. No, it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, how many per you know strategic account do you have to go out and give those presentations and demos, and then the whole product, right? Scalability, all those things I talked about. And we always, like we live here at Omadim with, with, with kind of the saying that I think crystallizes the trend. And that is that as a consumer, right? As us, we can go online and buy a $55,000 Tesla in five minutes. Yet a $55,000 SaaS transaction could take five months. Why is that? Because we sometimes put our process between the seller and the buyer where consumers have said, whatever's in the middle, get rid of it. Let's make it easy for the buyer to buy. Let's empower that buyer. So I think that's where the trends are going to continue. I believe that B2B is complex. And if I can give them as much information as Leah said, more information, more demos, more digital assets, more videos, they become smarter on their own when it's convenient for them. Heck, a meeting ended 10 minutes or they go into a portal and say, hey, tell me about DocuSign's parallel workflow, right? And they got that question answered and they move on, right? But it allows them to buy the way they want to buy. But then sales can come in for what I call a collaborative process, not a controlling process. And that's the key of the, the trends is sales' role can be more. And Leah talked a lot about it and Tom talked a lot about this collaboration, this consulting point of view. That's where pre-sales role is, right? It's helping that buyer to get to the finish line but gosh darn it, like get rid of the process, right? It, it, to, 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 to Leah's point, if a, if a buyer can buy DocuSign on their own, I'm sorry, you don't have to insert your process in there just because that's your process. Allow them to buy, empower them to buy. So I think that's where the big trend is going to change is we're all consumers. We can all go into Best Buy. And sometimes if someone asks us if we need help and we say, I'm just looking, let them look. This doesn't have to follow a process, right? You can let them look and they'll come back better educated. And just because they're not buying today doesn't mean they're not a good buyer. They could buy three months from now, six months from now. They just needed that, that pace to get there. So I think that's where the big trend is changing in, in, in my opinion is get rid of the friction, help your buyers buy mentality as opposed to our process, let's follow it. And buyers be damned, right? In a, in a slang way. Yeah, so love that. I do want to play devil's advocate for a minute. What are the risks to turning over the keys to the kingdom in that very buyer, buyer forward Tesla model? Yeah, I, I think that, that that's where, you know, technology can play a role, right? And I, and, and I, I think uh, a, a very senior pre-sales engineer once said something to me that I, I take to bed, I take to, 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 to always, and that is that too much information is the same as no information. Right. So if you just throw it over the fence and say, have at it, here's our new POC or POV, just like I said with product or growth, they may fail because you overwhelm them. What you need to do is you need an iterative process that allows them to engage in your product, get some insights from that engagement and then take action digitally. So you continue to help them and you know, kind of like a nurture, right? Help them learn 
They don't want to learn 50 things about a way a product works day one. They want to learn they have a few questions. Let them ask, let them see the information. They'll be a little bit better educated. So I think this idea of, of completely throwing the keys you know, over the fence, we've got customers that do POCs, but they use OMADIM as a way to kind of guide them and wrap their arms around them and keep them moving in the right direction. Because I think, you know, Rachel, that's a great point. You can't, like anything else in life, right? There's not one size fits all. And there's not just, hey, you know, oh, from now on, just let everyone self demo and digital first, because not every company's ready for that. Not every product ready for that. And frankly, if buyers were honest, they would say that they're not all ready either, right? They want some of that guidance. They just don't want you to throw the kitchen sink out of them via, you know, a microsite. So here's 150 things you can look at, or here's 93 minute videos. Guess what? Which one do I watch? Like that's hard. You haven't really, you've, you've changed the problem. You haven't solved the problem. So I think that's where you got to be, continue to be engaged. As Tony said that, Tanya said that, that engagement, that consultative selling. Yeah. Well, we actually got a great question from Chris in the audience, um, actually right on the back of this topic. So would love to hear your thoughts. And this is to any of you guys on different buying tools that help with that empowering the buyers. So helping to put some of those guardrails in place while still letting them you know, have the keys to the castle for a little bit. Um, what are you guys seeing is as really successful in terms of those different tools that can help empower them? Yeah, we only see one tool, frankly. So we know. <laughs> <laughs> is, are there others or is it just all vanilla? This is not like Baskin Robbins, is it? <laughs> no, clearly. I mean, that's what we do for a living. So our tool is there and, and, and you know, everyone can evaluate it for themselves. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to make this a commercial. We're there to help, right? It augment the, the, the real brain thrust of the organization around that product and the experience and those discovery questions and how you help that buyer buy. And are and you right, I'll and, uh, share. Oh, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll share right. Like at DocuSign, um, we are evaluating Omidum. I think the differentiator that you bring to the table that we haven't seen in some of the other platforms is it's almost like the Google meets YouTube, right? Like you can put these digital assets out there, but you can search the video. So if you want to come in and just understand you know, again, it's like meeting the buyers where they are, you know, three important concepts, you can, you can pinpoint those very quickly, um, versus having to, you know, navigate through, okay, there's four to eight things that were shared with me, I really care about three, like, how do I, and, and then the stats, um, and the data provided behind that is on another level. Um, so I'll just obviously be very transparent there as well. Thank you. Yeah. No, appreciate that. Um, we are running up on time and I, I think, um, oh, and, and, but there is a little bit of a follow-up on that. So for doing the actual demos, are you guys seeing like recorded videos, guided demos, like, like what, what is that format, um, as, as part of that follow-up? So our technology is video-based, as we just said, you, you take your, what we call everyday Content doesn't matter if it's an early demo, technical demo, whiteboard demo, sales presentation, scalability presentation, doesn't matter. Video ties it, put it in our platform, and it becomes 100% searchable. Ask a question, show me workflow, it'll find the 12 minute mark of the 13th video where that's being demonstrated. So we use video because, right? I think Honya said this, one of our customers uses this word snackables because adults do not want to sit through 60 minutes hoping that you're going to address their question. They want to get in get their question answered and get out and, you know, engage it maybe five or 10 minutes, but holy mackerel, if you've answered five of those questions. So, so we rely on video. There are other solutions out there that, that clearly, right. Help augment pre-sales. Don't want to diminish any of those, right. It's a different, depends on what your what problem you're trying to solve, I think is the, is the right answer, but there's lots of technology out there that would doable, but at the end of the day, those snackables is what are, and I wish I could take credit for it, but our customers said, Greg, it's all about the snackables. <laughs> is that a compliment or insult? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's also just the trend that we see, right? The snackable bite size, like 
you know, if I want to fix my kitchen sink, I actually am going to go to TikTok before I'm going to go to a 20 minute YouTube video. I want to see the three minute. And then if I need to go deeper, I'm not actually fixing my kitchen sink. But <laughs> the, in, in theory, I'm getting the snack bites of like what actually needs to be done. Um, and, and I think that's just like the world we live in right now, uh, which is so important. If that's the experience you're having, which I think is our theme today, if that's the experience I'm having out there in the real world, why should my buyer experience be different? Um, and so with that, we are coming up on time. I do want to make sure we have a, a quick thank you to our sponsor today. So I'm going to pop back and uh, finish sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you guys can see that. Oh, oh, it went and then it went. And went. Um, love, love these, uh, these moments. Well, uh, I do want to thank you so much, Greg. And um, sorry. Thank you so much, Greg, and, and all of our panelists, as well as Omadim, um, which I feel like we've heard a lot about. But Greg, if there's anything else you want to share, we really appreciate your sponsorship and partnership with the Pre-Sales Collective. No, I think at the end of the day, right, just ask questions, right? We're here today to help. We think it, it, it's elevated. I couldn't be, you know, more humbled to be with a team of people on this panel that, have, that you know, are doing this every day. And so, you know, Omadim is my demo spelled backwards because we're flipping the script on the buying experience. It's a, it's a lot different. So thanks everyone for attending and, and, and Leah and Onya, thank you for, for joining us today on this, on, through this process. Awesome. And we do, yeah. <laughs> We do have a quick poll, uh, so I uh, would love to know how we did today. And I also just want to make a quick plug for our next event. Um, so would love for you guys to let us know how do we do? How did we do? What feedback do you have for us? And hopefully you can join us. Our next event is presented by Consensus. Um, you can see it here as well as if you visit the Presales Collective website. There's a whole host of other events and webinars, both coming to a city near you or virtually, we would love to have you join. And if you don't see a topic that you're interested in, please let us know. We are always open to new ideas for these. Um, with that, I really wanna thank Leah, Tanya and Greg for all of your insight today. I took a ton of notes, round of applause. Um, I think it's been really clear the importance that data plays in as we make these decisions, as well as the future of the role in pre-sales and making sure that we are part of that buyer enablement experience. So um, thank you guys so much. Thank you to all of our attendees. I uh, hope you enjoyed our presentation today. And uh, with that, we hope to see you at a future event.